Your Partner in Success Radio is a free business podcast with host Denise Griffiths. It's all about great stories, conversation, and context to help you move your business and life forward with actionable tips and advice from her guest experts. To listen and subscribe, just find us on iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you consume your podcasts. Welcome to your Partner in Success Radio, where top performers share their secrets to help you achieve your personal and professional goals. I'm your host, Denise Griffiths, and together with my incredible guests, we'll bring you inspiring and actionable insights to take your life and your business to the next level. And ranked in the top 2% globally, this podcast really is a must-listen, so let's dive in. My guest today, I'm really excited about this. My guest today, Angie Morgan Witkowski, is a New York Times bestselling author, leadership coach, and keynote speaker. And she learned how to lead in the Marine Corps, and I have such respect for our military, past, present, future. And that was an experience that inspires her work. And her most recent book, Bet on You, How to Win with Risk, examines just how to enact risk in meaningful ways. And in Bet on You, Bet on You, I don't want to slur my words here. In the South, we slur our consonants, and sometimes people say, what did you just say? And bet on you. Angie Morgan and Courtney Lynch reveal hard-earned real-world in, real insights that are going to help you realize your potential by enacting risk in really meaningful ways that mean the most to you. And her risk-taking guidance has been embraced by the world's best businesses, Google, Boston Scientific, FedEx, and Oracle. And their insights are the secret sauce behind any transformative journey to a successful life. So, Angie, welcome to your partner, Success Radio. It's so good to have you here. It is really great to be here, Denise. And I love the focus of your program because I know I've benefited from listening to many of the guests that you've had on your show. And it takes all of us sharing our ideas, perspectives to grow and succeed and stay inspired. So thanks for the work that you're doing. Oh, thank you. And, you know, I've mentioned this a lot on this podcast. My guests, and I've interviewed probably close to 700 people right now, a lot of whom are authors. And honestly, the truth is, and I mean this from the bottom of my heart, y'all are in many ways my mentors. I read your <laughs> books. This office is, I have hundreds of books in here and yours is in here. I call this my, really, it's my entrepreneurial library. I read them. I mean, I read them and then I review them and I share them because every one of them has multiple points that I need to go back and, ooh, let me read that again. Oh, I forgot about that. I'm constantly picking up one of these books and thumbing through it, I'll, you know, several points during the day. So thank you for being one of my mentors. <laughs> well, it's, it's a true honor. And that is such a true point about – reading and learning and developing. That's one of the ways that I stay inspired too. About a few years ago, I decided to add, you know, the Apple iPhone book reader on my phone. I'm sure there's a quicker, tidier way to say that app, but I thought, you know, I can wait for my kids to get out of practice. I can scroll through social media or I can read books. And it's a different mindset that you embrace when you're constantly filling your mind with inspiration. And so that was a real big game changer for me. I'm an avid reader. Fortunately, I was an English major in undergrad, and that just fueled my love of literature. So that's something that is always, always um, on my activity list to do. I'm so glad you mentioned that. I got sucked into Reddit, which is mm -hmm. not a bad place to spend time, but I was spending way too much time in one of the subs that's, I'm not going to even say what it's about. Um, it's about some former royals. That's all you need to know. And I got, <laughs> I got big time sucked in. And then I got irritated with myself because I was spending time looking at people that I have absolutely no use for. And so I said, no, I got rid of the app and I went back to, reading, which I always do. I read a lot. I'm a voracious reader, but I'm not wasting my time on complete and total nonsense. But I did get sucked in and I, I caught myself, you're going to laugh. I actually raised my left hand and I smacked it with my right hand and said, bad Denise. And then I deleted everything. <laughs> 
part of leadership and growth and development, isn't it? Recognizing that the steady stream diet of information you're fueling your body with and your mind with isn't necessarily a good thing. And so I always think about books in three ways. I need a beach book. Like I always need something fun that I'm reading that is just for pure pleasure. And then I work in the leadership development space. So I always need to be reading some sort of self-help leadership business book because my clients are reading those and they're going to say, Hey, did you read Adam Grant or Hey, did you read this? And I want to say, yeah, so I can stay relevant. And I also, from a personal journey, I always have to read something good for my soul too. So I'm reading right now, Robert Greene's law of human nature. And I love his work. It is just so fascinating to see how deep he goes into subjects. So that might be something if you're listening and too, just to think like, what are the three books, you know, from a professional perspective, a personal perspective and something for the beach, especially now that we're heading into the summer. I do much the same. Um, I have two iPad pros, a regular iPad and an iPhone, and all of them have the Kindle app on it. Mm -hmm. And I'm reading any number of books in any room at any time but I know I'm like you you know I've got specific arenas if you will that I need to be reading and then I've got my audible you know account and I don't read or listen to fiction on audible I want business books so this morning or last night rather I fell asleep listening to Napoleon Hill I woke up listening to Napoleon Hill I'm pretty sure I got all of it by osmosis I'm pretty sure. <laughs> and you're on your way to wealth, Denise. I am. <laughs> the of a millionaire. <laughs> That's exactly right. But tell us about the, well, first of all, tell us a bit about you and what inspired you to concern, to pursue, I can't talk today, to pursue your current career of, of this passion and how did it get started? Well, thank you for the opportunity to share my story. I grew up in northern Michigan before the internet, and I know that dates me way back, but that was my life growing up. And I was a reader. I read the encyclopedia, and I knew that there was like this big, when the encyclopedia wasn't Wikipedia, I should say, I had a set of encyclopedia books. I'd constantly flip through as information in the world was changing. I Do you have thought, the red ones? Do you have the whole row of the red ones? Not the red ones. These were like the I kids' do. version. So you do my, have the red ones? No, I, when my grandparents passed, I relocated them. Nobody wanted them. So I'll take them. I've got all of them, but one. I think I'm missing one. Isn't that amazing to think of a time when all that was supposedly knowable about this word could fit on a world that could fit on a bookshelf and think about the vast amount right. of information today? It's crazy. I knew that there was this big world out there, though. I also read a lot of Sweet Valley High and, you know, what was California like? All these questions in my mind. And my first big step was leaving my small town community to go to the University of Michigan. And it was a really diverse School, which is something very exciting, but apparently that wasn't enough for me. I wanted to see more of the world. And my dad had been a Marine and he recommended that I look into the ROTC program, which is like the military training program. You go there for four years, you get out as a manager, essentially in the military as an officer. And so I applied for a scholarship. I had my college paid for, like what a great thing. Even back then college was expensive. It's not as expensive certainly as it is today, but it was wonderful to get out of college with an English degree, a job, and the opportunity to serve my country. I spent four years in the Marine Corps and then decided to leave active duty. I transitioned and found myself working in Los Angeles in pharmaceutical sales. And I just found that that career, though I was making great money and having these amazing experiences, something was missing internally for me. And that was, I think, the service component that I really grew into as a result of my time in uniform. It didn't take long for a woman I served with. She was having her own, like, gosh, what, why am I not happy? I'm making good money and this just something is missing. And we came together to talk about our Marine Corps experiences and what was different about the private sector. And that really was, gosh, early 2000s. And that launched a career in speaking, training, consulting. I've written three books on leadership development, really inspired by the time in the Marine Corps. And now, you know, today I spend a lot of time keynoting and working with executives in a coaching capacity, facilitating training programs, but I also love to write. And I just recently published Bet on You, How to Win with Risk, to help people think about how they can take this concept of risk and apply it to their lives in order to achieve 
meaningful success and however they define it, meaningful success. I read this book this weekend. I had gone through it when it first landed on my desk, I think about a month ago. And I have in my my office, I have several bookcases. And one top shelf is for the books that, you know, these are guests that are going to be on. And there's also for the books that need to be yet reviewed. So they're not getting really shelved. And I don't have a Dewey Decimal System, but they're not getting (laughs) truly shelved Uh until those books have been taken care of. So I was thumb through it and went, ooh. So this weekend, gorgeous weather outside. So I took it outside and I sat at my bistro table with my dog for hours. And I was tagging things and I was reading things. And one of the things, and this is, uh, I thought this is so important. One of the things that you said is the subtitle, I believe, risk-taking isn't just for epic moments. Well, no kidding. And I never thought of it like that. I'm so glad that you called that out, and I'm even more honored that you spent the time to go through the book. I think that's really unique of a podcast host to take such care and attention to guests, so thank you, Denise, for, for reviewing that. And that was really when I was writing, you know, Courtney and I wrote this book together, and whenever you write with a co-author, you know, there is somebody who sits down and puts the ideas and thoughts together, and typically the one with the English major, so that was my fun task in the book writing process. But going through um, writing, that was something really important that I knew that we both wanted to share was that we think of risk as going to the casino after we pulled out all of our money and putting it all on red 21 and we either win big or we lose big. And that's not the case at all. I think about some of the most meaningful risks I take in my life are initiating conflict in a relationship that's definitely a risk. Why don't we give people feedback? Well, we're concerned, we're afraid of how it's going to go. And sometimes that piece of information that you share with someone could really transform a relationship. And yeah, there's potential for it to introduce some discomfort in that relationship. So that's just one example of how risk isn't just moments. Or even if you're trying to start a new workout routine or try to start a new diet, I mean, making that conscious white knuckle choice that I'm not going to eat this today or I'm going to walk a mile today and dang it, I'm going to do it. And, you know, to the outside looking in, they may not see the the struggle or the battle, but internally it's, it's agonizing sometimes for us individuals. And so if we can start to see that risk isn't, you know, the opposite of reward, it's the path to reward. And it's the skill that's going to get us from here to where we need to be. We start to open our mind. Okay, I need to learn a little bit more about this. Exactly. And you know what I heard the other day or read, and I can't remember now what it was, probably read it, was that if you're going to take a risk or if you're going to make a habit, which for a lot of us, we've got these old habits that are just it's like, really, why? Why do I still have that old habit? And then we smack ourselves around and then we go do it again because we haven't changed it or we haven't you know, said, okay, this needs to stop. I need to take a risk and do something different. And what I heard or read, I'm going to have to figure out where I found that, was that basically if you are going to take a different step and try to you know, pave over those neural pathways and start new thoughts, tag it to something you're already doing where there is no risk, like brushing your teeth. Let's just say, you know, okay, I'm not going to eat that donut. I'm not because I hate them. I hate sweet foods. But, you know, a lot of people like donuts, which I don't understand. But you say, okay, I'm going to spend five minutes while I'm brushing my teeth to look myself in the eye and say, Denise, you're great. You've got these. This is what you're grateful for. Then increase it, you know, 10 minutes more. Or you know, But always when you're trying to start doing something new, attach it to something that you're already doing so it's it doesn't freak you out does that make any sense oh, Did that I makes even perfect explain that well you you explained it perfectly and that's part of the change process is that it is really hard to correct a bad behavior it's easier to build a better behavior over it and that's something i'm constantly thinking about when i think about the type of changes i want to enact into my life is and that's really like the definition of risk it's making a decision that leads you into uncertainty. Again, it's not doing something reckless or dangerous. 
It's making a decision that leads you into uncertainty. And we do this all the time. It's how then do I do it more intentionally when it comes to the dreams that are in my mind, they're on my heart. I just haven't taken the action yet. And when we think about that, it's like, well, why haven't I taken the action yet? It's often because we're scared or we don't know. We just don't even know where to start. Like it seems like such a big thing. And so start small. Just start really exactly. small. Take the pressure off yourself. Right, right. And, you know, once you make that step and go, oh, well, that wasn't so bad. Nobody, you know, knocked me to the dirt. I'm good. I got this. So keep on going. It's so funny because our mind has such this power to catastrophize what one false step would look like. I have a friend who's an executive director of a nonprofit, and she wanted to be an independent consultant. She had an easier time imagining herself homeless on the streets of Chicago begging for drugs than she did of doubling her salary in a couple of years' time. And it's just amazing. That's wow. the trick I know. And I'm like, you know, friend, I'm sure that somebody would stop you along the way if you didn't stop yourself. Like we could right these wrongs before we got to that, you know, hard left turn <laughs> that your mind took. But it is true. It's like we think one false step and we are done. And it's like, no, one false step, gain your footing, get another false step. And that was one of the misconceptions actually wrote about in the book is that risk taking isn't a leap. It's not quit your job, change your life, rip the bandaid off. It's not 90 day fiance. Like those are real crazy risks. Risk-taking is one small step followed by another. Get confidence and comfort in the new behaviors of building. And pretty soon you're going to be there. Exactly. And it sounds easy because it is. But you have to be in charge of your own mind. You have to pay attention. And listen, we all talk ugly to ourselves. We do. And I've said this on the radio before. If anybody let's say in a Walmart parking lot, spoke to me the way I speak to myself sometimes, I'd need bail money. No question about it. <laughs> it's true. I mean, it really is true. Um, part of my work with coaching is have people talk out loud and say kind things about themselves. And you would think that you're, you're asking them to be magicians and disappear the Empire State Building. <laughs> it's just like it's not that hard. But it can be that hard. <laughs> it can be, especially when you're looking in the mirror and going, oh, is that a wrinkle? Oh, crap. You know, because you get distracted. <laughs> and you get distracted on purpose. It's just a way to, you know, move around what you need to do because you really haven't set your mind on doing it. I think sometimes with that process as well, we don't go deep into this um, in Bet on You. It's certainly something I bring to my coaching programs is the stories that we tell ourselves. And sometimes the negative self-talk that we have fulfills a storyline, maybe that of a victim, maybe that of an orphan, maybe that of, you know, somebody who nothing ever seems to work out for. And there has to be a time in our life where, and I love you said this beautifully, Denise, is you have to take control of your own mind. And then you can understand that if you don't like the story that you're living, you can change your story. It's a conscious choice. And you could start rather than being the victim, you could be the hero. And what do heroes say to themselves when they're faced with challenge or uncertainty or self-doubt? They say, buckle up. We're going to power through this. I thought they said, let's kick ass, but I like yours better. Oh, I like yours better, actually. Done. Changing okay. my, I'll change my story about that story. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things, and I'm still reading, your, listen, I'm on not quite to section one. I've got stickies all over this thing. And in my my way of doing things, the pink ones are, oh, you know, those are where I started laughing out loud. The yellow ones are, go back and read this again. And you talk in here about your personal risk manifesto. Let's go down there because I think that's fascinating. I love that you're talking about a manifesto. It's part of that mindset, isn't it? It really is. There's a free companion to the book because I, I believe reading is one of the, I love it, and it's one of the lowest forms of learning just because you read a book on Decision making doesn't make you an expert decision maker. You actually have to put the practice into, into effect. So reading is great because it can inspire you and it can give you information, but information without action is, you know, well, it's not going to take you very far. So we have this 
um, online companion called the Risk Manifesto that allows you to dream a little bit better and get more clarity around the type of risk that you want to invite into your life. Because I think that's also important, risk-taking for risk-taking's sake. That's not necessarily responsible with those precious resources that you have, particular being your time. So before you want to take a risk, clarify your dreams. And that was the message. And that's the tool that we have online is just walking you through a series of questions that can help you gain clarity around the direction in life. And when we think about our life too, often we put so much emphasis on our career, but there's other facets of our life. What about the quality of life, like the quality of your days, the stuff that you do outside of work, like your health, your fitness, your faith? And what about things that you're doing to serve? Are you nurturing a community in in whatever way that you define a community? And then thinking too, what are you doing for fun? Because I've met so many professionals who are not having any fun in their life whatsoever. And going to a movie that your kids want to see is not necessarily your flavor of fun, but trying to figure out how you can enjoy life because that's the piece in life that makes everything else that you're doing to sacrifice worth it. Exactly. And here I am on page 79, five simple steps to transform your life. Number one, decide to change. We just talked about that. Number two, make the change. Number three, this is important, appreciate the change. Step four, Enact more change. Step five, realize your success. And honestly, I think that's where a lot of us just, we don't get to step five. We're like, okay, now i got to go do something else. And we we get real busy and off we go. And we don't take that moment or those few moments or whatever it's going to take to really sit down and say, hey, good girl, you got this. And this is why you've got this. This is what you did. And that also builds your confidence, too. And it's funny as you're reading that, Denise, it seems so easy on paper with five-step process to enacting change in your life. But the real work is in the fine print or the not printed. It's it's sitting with your mind and making those struggles and being courageous, even though when your mind says, oh, this is a little bit scary. And yeah, when you get to a milestone, being able to internalize that your success was because of your action, not, oh, I was in the right place at the right time, or it was a team, it wasn't me. I mean, nobody's success is is seriously just singular, but at the same time, you have to come to a place where you realize that you did it, and you need that because that builds your confidence. It does, and listen, we all are, we all have imposter syndrome. All day, every day. It just depends Mm -hmm. on what time of the morning it is and how we're going to deal with it. We all have it. I have it. I mean, I'm sure you do too. Oh, I. you know, it's funny. I was talking to somebody about this the other day, and it was on the surface, like a really successful senior C-suite leader in this fast growth organization. And he's like, you know, I have the imposter syndrome. And now he said it. And it wasn't necessarily what I was expecting from him. But the next thing surprised me. He's like, but you know what? That motivates me. When I feel like like I'm in awe of the responsibility I'm stepping into, I don't get afraid. He goes, or maybe a little bit, but he goes, I use that fear to motivate me. And I'm like, that's a great interpretation of how we should treat this imposter syndrome. And I'm with you. I think we all have doses of it. And what's our relationship with it? That's something we should be curious about. Exactly. And I love how you put that. What's our relationship with it? You know, for the longest kind of time, I'm an introvert. Everybody who knows me or listens to me knows that I'm a highly committed, highly committed introvert. (laughs) I'm not shy and I don't have any filters. We all know that as well. But I need to be completely left alone about 98% of the time. I'm good around people for about 59 and three quarter minutes. I've timed it. But after that, I have to go. I've got to go get back in my own head and poke around in there. It's where I'm happy in there. But it, sometimes it's a risk for me to get out and about. It really is. And I know that I'm – listen, when I'm going to the grocery store, you're going to laugh, but I put on my, my big black baseball cap, my biggest Ray-Bans, and my resting bitch face, and off I go. It doesn't work. People always want to talk to me <laughs> for some reason. And I do enjoy it. I, you know, I get to talk with people in the grocery store. The other day in the gas station, I had my back turned to this guy, and he said, you don't need much gas? And I looked, and I said, no, I don't trust my gas gauge. And we had a big old conversation. Never saw that coming. So, but when I, when I leave my house, 
I act like it's going to be a risk, and I'm darned if I know why. I have to work on that. I feel like we all have something in our life, too, that we have to self-talk our way into to make sure that, yeah, the, the experience that we own, so like in a personal perspective, I've been working on my personal brand. I've been building my company. Now it's building my unique point of view. So I've been doing a lot more videos and social postings and just exposing more of my life and my opinions. And there's not a day that goes by when I'm not a little bit of afraid. Am I going to say something that is going to be taken the wrong way? Am I going to say something that God forbid is going to offend somebody? And you could spend a lot of time just kind of in your head and limiting yourself, but then for me, that doesn't help me achieve my goals of being authentic and expressing myself. And so having that type of courage and self-talk to get you into those moments can be really important. Ray-Bans help. They and Ray-Bans. Seriously. <laughs> <laughs> the biggest, blackest Ray-Bans. <laughs> Go get the heavy ones. So I'm on page 149, and you're talking about risking in career. And this is your story. And you say success shouldn't feel like a chore. Let's definitely dive into that. Yeah, there's been plenty of times in my career, and I've been an, an entrepreneur for almost 20 years. I'm almost sure it's been 20 years. And there have been times when the hustle's been harder, and I've deferred gratification in my life just for the win or the goal that I was pursuing. And then sometimes it just feels like it's it's not worth it. And there have been plenty of times in my career when I was you know, traveling, especially when I had younger kids. When I felt like I was traveling too much and I wasn't able to be the type of mom or be the type of spouse that I really wanted to be in those relationships. And so sometimes when you think about the responsibilities that you have and that you've chosen to have and you step into and they feel like a chore, that should be like a pink flag in your mind to say, what's going on in other areas of your life? Because these are your choices that you brought into your world. You should feel differently about them. And so that's been something that I've, I think, constantly struggled. Am I working too hard? Am I not being you know, the best mom in this space? Am I not spending enough time with my partner, with my friends, with my family? And when I feel like I'm starting to resent something because it's too hard, that's usually a trigger for me that, like, you need to back away from that a little bit. I do the same thing. Once my spidey sense kind of pops up and says, I don't know, you're hearing this in your own head too many times. You may want to either get out of it or back away from it or, you know, postpone it, but there's something wrong. And listen to it. And it's funny with that. Oh, I do. Sometimes, yeah, you know, our, we get these gut instincts, but our head talks us out of what our body is trying to tell us. We have to trust our instincts a lot more. And that's a tough one for a lot of people. Like if you're sitting and listening to this right now and you've got this dream and it's like calling you and you can feel it in your bones, but your mind is probably telling you, that's not the time. Don't be selfish. Follow the path that you put all this time in. Don't do it right now. You know, there's Mm -hmm. always that. Can't afford it. Sometimes it's an investment, not a cost. And you need to figure the difference between those yeah and you know I always think too like whenever I have those like oh now is not the time I typically look around and find the people who are doing it and say well they've done it it is it's and not as good as thing. I can either you know yeah. I can do it better <laughs> I can Get, figure this keep out going. It, was, it was funny I was taking my son to a lacrosse tournament this week and we've been doing a lot of these lately and typically when you go to lacrosse tournaments it's all day and so you kind of get you know when they're playing or they're off with their friends you get a little bored so I've been wanting a camper Uh, I said listen I could take a nap I could do my work I could chill out I could do a lot of things if we just had a camper and so my son this week he's like you know mom this is the fifth time that you've talked about having a camper other people have campers why aren't you having a camper and I'm like dang it Way to call me out, child. You're absolutely right. So I started camper shopping yesterday. Small thing. Other people are doing it. Why not me? Bet on you, Andy. Bet on you. you. I want pictures when you get it. Are you going <laughs> oh, to have pictures? Or, or she, is it going to have air conditioning? Because for me, camping requires air conditioning. <laughs> 
I was from the Marine Corps, same with my husband, because he was a Marine as well. We're like, we're not camping where we have to sleep on the ground anymore. We're done with that. We turned that chapter in our life. We're now into more of the glamping. It's going to be a little bit more luxurious. There should be air conditioning, especially where you lived in East in the South. We oh, probably no. need a heater up north in Michigan. <laughs> I never turn. I haven't turned my heater on in a decade, but my air conditioner... You know, when it's time to turn it back on and we're getting to that time of year, we only have two seasons, hot and hotter in hell. And then the mm-hmm. hurricane season, which is six months of the year. But I go outside, I kid you not, I go outside and I, I say thank you to the air conditioner, pet her on the head and say, good job. Don't fail me now. <laughs> My neighbor doesn't think I'm nuts because he does the same thing with his. <laughs> so it's kind of crazy. But you you talk a lot and you mentioned it a couple of times and I'm reading it a lot in your book about dreaming. I really want to dig into that. One of the things that we don't do enough as adults in particular, and I could probably make the argument of kids too, is that we don't daydream enough. We certainly sleep and we have dreams at night, but when during the day do we unmoor our minds? And technology has made it so easy for us not to do that. Because we, you know, if we're sitting on a park bench, if we're waiting in a doctor's office, if we're sitting on a bus or commuting to work, we've got something going on in the background that's captivating our attention and our mind. And oftentimes, too, giving us messages that, hey, you're not thin enough. Hey, you're not rich enough. Hey, your clothes are all wrong. Buy some more clothes. And so not only are we not dreaming or daydreaming or paying attention to our own minds, we're also feeling worse about ourselves than when we start off. Dreaming is so important is that you get to a stage in your life and you're like, gosh, I've been going through the motions and it's not adding up to anything that I'm really excited about. I used to want to do these things and whatever happened to those, but we don't give ourselves the time to explore. Like, what should I be doing with my life? What do, what, what's meaningful for me? I know it's meaningful for everybody else. And the way to get reconnected with that is to start daydreaming. And it's not like scheduling two to three on a Thursday in your Outlook calendar to say time for dreaming. And then suddenly the answer to your life's burning questions is going to be revealed. It's more like a process. Start with disconnecting. And one of the things I do going back to lacrosse is I always bring a notebook with me to lacrosse games. So if I'm sitting there and an idea sparks, I just kind of write it down. Journaling is a great way to clarify kind of what's in your heart and more authentic to what it is you're pursued. Like I was thinking too, I was listening the other day and I don't remember who I was listening to, but they were talking about just the dreams when we were kids and these visions that we had for our life, they don't go away, they get buried. So maybe an opportunity for all of us is to resurface those insights in, into our own preferences and ideas about what is meaningful to us. So walking, reflecting, even this, talk out loud to somebody, talk out loud to your spouse or a friend or a partner, because you will discover through the you know, verbalization of your ideas that you're going to have insights into things that you should be doing or could be doing with your time and your life. Angie, do you ever lucid dream? You sound like you probably do. (laughs) A little bit (laughs) to that. Do you do that, Denise? Every single night. I don't sleep a whole lot. I never have. I tend to catnap. If I sleep eight hours in a row, put me in a hospital because there's something really wrong with me. I'm sick. But I will sleep two or three hours, three if I'm lucky. Then you know, I may get up. I've been known to make a gumbo at three in the morning. but And then I go back to sleep for maybe an hour, but I lucid dream. In fact, I had one, I think last week sometime, that was so annoying that I kept waking myself up to change a channel, and it wouldn't let me. So finally I just said, heck with you, and I went and cooked something. But... Yeah, I lucid dream a lot, but I write them down. I have a dream journal because Mm. it's my subconscious telling me something I'm not probably hearing when I'm awake. I think so, too. That subconscious um, mind has a lot of information for us, and if we just slowed down a bit and paid attention to it, it could be really revealing on the small changes. I don't, you know, most people I connect with, you know, very few, I should say, need to do a complete life overhaul, a complete life transformation. But I do know a lot of unhappy people, and if they could take small risks to get them back to finding their, their joy in life, getting them back to finding, you know, and discovering or rediscovering their values, they could 
feel much happier, more content with where they are. Give us some examples, if you would, about the conversations that you've had recently where small risks were very apparent to you, but not apparent to the person you were chatting with. Oh my gosh, all the time. And a lot of it has to do with people like the smallest risk is trying to find a routine in your life and not feel like you're a dog on a choker collar. Like if you feel like the quality of your days are hurried and you're at the mercy of everybody's schedule, a small risk would be waking up earlier, at least a half hour earlier, if not an hour earlier, and dedicating time to yourself where you can put intention into your day. And what's, you know, the risk is really it's comfort. Who doesn't like to sleep in an hour more? But the gain is prioritizing your needs, your desires, in your life and not feeling at the mercy of life circumstance. So that would be an example of a risk that I work on with a lot of my coaching clients is just helping them restructure their time so they can find a healthy rhythm that supports their whole life, not just the priorities that other people tell them are really important to them. So that would be one one small risk. I also do talk a lot of people who want to have secondary sources of income, whether it's a short-term rental or investing in a business. And these are people who have the means to do it they just catastrophize failure. They're like, I can't do this. And then like a lot of people are doing it and they're succeeding really in these areas. And so helping them see examples of people living their dreams. And that's something I like to tell people like right now, believe it or not, you are living somebody else's dream. So start there, really appreciating all that you've earned and all that you've accomplished and then reflecting How can my life be a little bit better? What have I always wanted to do? What gifts and skills do I have that are being underutilized? And through that reflection, you might discover that, hey, maybe there's a, maybe I'm playing it a little too safe. Maybe there's some more risk I can invite into my life. I love that. And, you know, one thing that we all kind of do, I think, and you're talking about getting up early, it's alone time is very important for even the most extroverted purple person we need purple we need mm-hmm. to be we need to have that alone time where we just sit and think or look at you know i spend a lot of time outside and on my bistro table at my bistro table because my garden my backyard honestly looks like secret garden it's just beautiful back there now we're getting close to the time where i can't go out there anymore if it gets too humid i get cranky very cranky mm-hmm. but anytime i can i'm out there and It's me and the dog. I'm breathing. I'm looking up at the pecan trees. I'm watching the clouds. And I'm clearing. And I might have just gotten up 10 minutes ago. But I'm clearing my thoughts. I'm clearing my brain. I'm breathing. And I'm expressing out loud, by the way, a lot of gratitude. It starts my day. There is plenty of research that promotes to exactly what you're talking about, but particularly that gratitude component to a life well lived. And that's part of my day too, is I end the day with a gratitude journal. And I, you know, I've got some friends, family members who kind of laugh at me about my rituals. And I will say to them, like, these are the things that I pin into my routine because they're the things that sustain me is spending time alone with my mind sustains me being appreciative and staying in a grateful state or coming back to a grateful state is something that sustains me connecting with people. Even I'm an introvert, not as hardcore Denise as you sound, but I know that most that people that's aren't. I don't think <laughs> <laughs> unless like you're wearing it. pocket protectors and big heavy glasses and don't speak to anybody ever. I'm not that person. You know, but for some other people, it could be cooking, but that's the thing that sustains them. That's what nourishes their soul. It's amazing how much we give of ourselves to other people and their wants and their needs and their desires for us. But when it comes to our own lives, going from the passenger seat into the driver's seat and making decisions Mm -hmm. about our choices, that can be a really, I call it taking agency over your life, making your decisions more important than the decisions of people around you and how you should be living your life. That can be a scary proposition. Starting to be the main character in your life when you're such a service to others, that's that's a risk. It is. And honestly, I never thought of myself as being of service to other people until people kept kind of smacking me in the head with it, going, Denise, why don't you know this about yourself? 
I don't know. <laughs> and I would whine a bit. <laughs> okay, fine. I'll listen to you now. But here's the thing. I am an introvert and I live alone, but I still, and I will always live alone, by the way, I will always need that first thing in the morning and the last thing at night time alone so to speak i'm not on the phone i'm not on my computer my ipads my I, everything's away from me i am just going out into the cosmos if you will and seeing what's out there what's going on that sounds like a wonderful life and certainly not a life of um i was gonna say exclusion it's really about prioritizing no. your needs to be able to move through this life as best as you can and that's Something, you know, again, a question that I have for a lot of people and it's something that we do raise and bet on you as well is there's no right way to live your life. There is your way. And part of that is dreaming. But it's also about finding the elements in your world that make you feel like we're winning. And we often think, like you said at the beginning of the podcast, of risk as in these epic moments. We think about winning in life as me versus you, like I win, you lose. We think of winning as battling a tiger in an arena, but really I think about winning as every day finding a chance to be better than I was the day before and minuscule ways. So how can I, you know, be a better listener, be a better parent, be a better spouse, better take care of myself. And that's coming from the Marine Corps. I'm a competitive person, but I've learned to channel the competition within myself on how we can have these winning moments all the time. And so you just actually answered what was going to be my next question, which is what are some of the core values or the principles that guide you and how do you stay true to them? And I think you just answered that. I think it's a great uh, practice for anyone at any stage of their career is to revisit and reflect upon their values and don't stop there, making sure that you're living them, that you're aligned to them. And to me, uh, one of my core values is, is really feeling that winning spirit every day. And it took me a lot, especially going through the Marine Corps, to learn that it's not dominating somebody else. It's just growth. My commitment to my own growth and development is a value that I have so importantly, as is being an entrepreneur, as is being a creative, as is being a parent and a good spouse. Um, there's a wonderful just you know research about having your values close enough to you that you're mindful of them because your values can serve as self-fulfilling prophecies. You've probably heard the question raised before, why do good people do bad things? It's not necessarily because they're bad people. It's just that they lost sight of their values. And one poor decision led to another poor decision led to another, and it's kind of snowballs. So I feel like the values in our lives serve as our North Star. And so always having them center in our life. So I think that that's something that's been really beneficial for me, too. Oh, I agree. So, Angie, what are some of your big, biggest achievements or accomplishments so far? <laughs> well, it's funny. Like, there's certainly, you know, with with books and titles and things like that. I would tell you, though, Denise, like, my greatest accomplishment in life is I am a fundamentally happy person. And I went through a lot of transformative change. You know, I lost my brother in my 20s. He died of suicide. That was a horrific experience. I, I, I love married... my brother the same way. Oh, you know what? I'm still mad at him. I understand. I understand. And finding forgiveness is the hardest thing to do in that journey. You know, and I also, you know, had... A uh, husband who um, I was married to while he was an active duty Marine, he deployed countless times. And, you know, when you send your spouse over to war, you never really know what's going to come back. And we're no longer married. And that was something that was pretty devastating. I even write about it in Bet on You. So going through the process of divorce, um, I have found that through life that, you know, happiness isn't served up to really anybody on a silver platter you got to fight for it and you got to work for it. And there's no happy pill. It's really sometimes sitting through the suffering of an experience, but doing the work and going through the process. So, again, yeah, it's I feel an inside like, job. I mean, nobody is going to, to make you happy. You have to make you happy. Or you have to understand mm -hmm. what your happiness is. It is. Yeah, absolutely. So I feel like that's, again, 
some of the, the best thing about life. I've, you know, at later 40s at the stage of my life and my career where fancy trips are nice. I like a good pair of shoes, but really just every day. Every day is a great day. We were talking about that. I'm so glad you said that. We were talking about that in our virtual green room, and you were telling me about this terrific conversation you had already this morning, and I was telling you that Farmer Denise went out and bought, you know, brought her two tiny little tomatoes in and ate them. I'm a farmer now. I have two tomato vines. <laughs> <laughs> I was so proud of those little tiny. Well, I didn't bring them inside. I actually just kind of wiped them on my shirt and ate them out there, but they were delicious. And they were mine. I grew them. So, you know, the silliest things can make you very happy or the best things like what you did today can just make you go, okay, my day is now shaped up. I'm ready to go. It is. I met earlier today with a couple of girlfriends. We're revitalizing a women's leadership awards banquet in our community. I live here in northern Michigan in Traverse City. And there's a national awards program called Athena Awards. And the committee that had been sponsoring decided that they were no longer going to to do the program because of some of the challenges through, through the pandemic. So we picked it up and we're running with it. And so it's been a true joy, not just because I get to work. I have very little time in my life for friendships outside of work. Uh, it's just kind of the pace I keep and the way that I rule. But if my friends can get together and work on a service project, that's when I have time for friendship. So I feel like there's a little bit of multitasking in there. <laughs> and so I, I will, as much as I can, make time for friends. And if we can do something in service of others, better. I was going to ask you about the Athena. She's the patron goddess of heroic endeavor, if I'm not not mistaken. Is that why the name? Yeah, it's actually a national program that you can become a chapter of. So or get licensing to use the Athena Awards. So we're bringing that back to our community. So it's, it's a big banquet. One woman in our community gets to be Athena for the year. And it's also, I just think it's great. I think that's something that we don't do enough is to celebrate and acknowledge other people's successes. And so it'll be it's kind of wonderful this fall up here in Northern Michigan. I'm kind of in my mind because we're doing it as a barn. Like I'm seeing this beautiful fall day. And all these women leaders gathering together and just celebrating one woman for her significant community accomplishments. It's going to be fun. See, I love autumn. We don't have it here in the Deep South. We really don't. Mm-hmm. But I, I stay get, and, you know, we don't get trees turning color unless they've been poisoned. Then they turn orange and die. But, you know, I will import all kinds of color, pumpkins, mums, and I just fake the heck out of it because I love autumn. So, you know, I pretend that it's autumn. It's not, but I pretend. I can see why we have the best fall up here. Not that I'm trying to rush away summer, believe me, because we haven't had it really yet, but we have the best weather up here in the fall. So we're pretty lucky in that regard. And see, I spend a lot of time, you know, September, October, looking at other people's pictures going, oh, keep them coming, keep them, keep sharing. <laughs> and in my head, I'm there. I'm right there with you. I can smell the pumpkins. I can smell the leaves. Our leaves turn tacky and they just drop. You know, they, they just fall down. They don't turn any kind of color other than drab khaki. Oh, but you've got fabulous winners. <laughs> <laughs> I've got pecans anyway. You have the squirrels there you leave go. Below. Exactly. Yeah. My squirrels, I kid you not, they, they're they lazy. I have found by stubbing my toe that they will go out. I've got a covered porch, and then I've got a patio underneath that, and the pecan trees are beyond that, that patio. And they have a little cemetery out there where they are just plugging in those pecans. And some, and I'll watch them. You know, about this time of year, they're out there digging them up and moving them around. They don't forget, by the way. Squirrels know exactly where they put those pecans. <laughs> I spent some time in the south and it was just magnificent I lived in North Carolina for a bit my first son was actually born in North Carolina my second son was born in Virginia and living on the east coast in the south was a very very special time in our life it's different here let's just leave it right there <laughs> That's all I've got to say. the food's good the people are nice it is amazing. <laughs> there we go okay so what are in your your business, what are some of the biggest 
<laughs> misconceptions or myths about the work that you do? Well, it's funny that you say that because I think first and foremost for my children, it's that I'm actually working <laughs> because I'm in my office <laughs> on my computer. They think I'm gaming all day long. It took them a while to realize that, no, 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 this is actually my vehicle for work. Um, well, I think some of the things I do, a variety of work I write, I think a lot of people think that writing with experience is easy. That's a huge misconception. Writing is exhausting and it's frustrating and it's amazing. All of those emotions all boiled together. So that would be one misconception. I feel that, you know, you when I was writing Bet on You, I would write practically five or, you know, five to seven pages. It would take me several hours and then getting to the end and saying, you know what, this just isn't good enough and then starting over. So that's, I think, a myth. Uh, a leadership coach, uh, too, that's something else I do for my clients, you know, working one-on-one with people. I think the myth is that I give people advice how to live their life, but that's completely false. I think people have within themselves a clear under, well, they have an understanding of where they need to direct their life. As a coach, I just ask really great questions and encourage them to think out loud so the clarity can come to them. So I don't tell my mom jokes. She's like, don't you get sick of telling people what to do? I'm like, I don't really tell people what to do. I ask really great questions and they can discover on their own what it is that they're meant to do. And I just hear the glamorous life of a keynote speaker isn't always so glamorous. I mean, it's, you know, lugging your suitcase around, getting delayed and staying overnight somewhere because you missed your flight. (laughs) But I, I get to meet with people who are most amazing. Oh, you're breaking up. How did that impact you during COVID? Did, were you, you know, still speaking? Were you zooming? What happened? So some of that, I spent a little bit more time consulting. So hopefully you can still hear me, Denise. Um, I can and, hear you now. Oh, okay, great. And I spent a lot. That's when I actually spent time writing Bet on You. So though I wasn't traveling and speaking, I was still coaching and I had more time to write and in many ways had to reinvent the business. And then I reunited during COVID with my college boyfriend. So I had a romance. I had a COVID romance. <laughs> going on. So, so that was one risk I took on myself too, how to bet on yourself, how to fall back in love uh, or give yourself the permission to fall back in love and be vulnerable with someone. After you oh. go through a heartbreak and divorce. So that was one of the biggest bets on myself. I bet. So what is going on with you now? Oh, I know. I got ahead of myself. So, Angie, what is the difference to you? Because we've been talking a lot about this on this podcast. What is the difference to you between coaching and mentoring? Consulting is a whole different thing. Yeah, I'm one of those people. I do a lot of consulting with my web clients and with you know people who are trying to start a podcast. Coaching to me is I'm doing a bit of it, like you, asking a lot of questions, but I am not entirely sure if I'm coaching or mentoring. I think I'm doing both. <laughs> I think it's Sometimes always a I feel like a marriage consultant. It's like, why'd you do that? <laughs> Don't do that. I think <laughs> one of the things I'm very clear with my clients is that when we work together, I am not a licensed therapist. We do not right. travel back in time to unravel daddy issues. I'm starting right today, and I'm talking about where you want to go. So coaching is me answering questions or me asking you questions to help pull out of you a clear vision for your life, um, a clear direction for your career. And then me mentoring is, hey, Angie, I have this employee. How might you handle this if you were in my position? And now I can give you, you know, I feel like that's where. Like, so if it's, again, if these are real burning questions on your heart and your mind, then please, like, let's get you clarify, clarity, clarity around them. But if, if you're having a really difficult issue with a client or an employee, I can give you my advice. See, and that's kind of how I do it. And I know that there some people say, well, there's some distinct differences between them, and they are pretty distinct. I mean, mentoring mm-hmm. is basically, you know, somebody asks you a question, you advise as best as you can. Coaching is saying, Okay, I'm, I hear you. So now where are we going to go? Exactly. And then I think that's too. It's like we can have great conversations, but the way that I hope to distinguish myself as a coach is that 
Yeah, we'll have great conversations, but we're going to go someplace too. I love the idea of a coach as going back to the original world, word of it. A coach was Cinderella, the coach. It was taking Cinderella somewhere where she wanted to be. So it's the, the, the art of transporting. And that's what I think a good ah, coach is. You're say that again. That was important. Yeah, so a coach, tra- helps, a coach carries you from where you are to where you want to be. They transport you. And so how do they do that? They do that through questioning and helping you clarify and giving you little mini homework assignments so you can do the work yourself. That is fascinating. So we've got just a few minutes left. I need to ask you, Angie, what advice, Mm -hmm. we're back to mentoring, do you have for others who are just starting out in your field or pursuing a similar passion? So that's a great question. I get this question a lot for people who want to, you know, write, coach, speak. I think the very first thing that you need to do is get clear on what it is that you want to say. And also be very specific about the the theme and your content. I know that when I started out, I'm like, oh, I can talk about anything and everything. And that doesn't really help because if you talk about anything and everything, you really are talking about nothing. So trying to get really specific. I talk about leading your life whether it's through risk-taking, whether it's through leadership practices I learned in the Marine Corps. So trying to really stay true to that core kind of theme message. And if you, you know, before you quit your job and change your life, get some experience with what it is that you want to do because it can be exciting, but it's sometimes a really lonely, hard road to follow. So you can do this as a side hustle before you have to make any sort of decision of leading um, secure employment. Exactly. Yeah, I have to tell you, when I when I got the book, and it is I'm re, I've read it a couple of times now in bits and far, starts, and then all the way through over the weekend. But I read the title, "Bet on You." I went, "Ooh, I like that." And then I got to the subtitle, "How to Win with Risk," and I went, "Uh oh, what does that even mean?" <laughs> So, so my question is, where did the title come from? Well, we knew we wanted to write a book on how to take risks because that's something that coming from the Marine Corps, Courtney and I both felt that we did really well. And then we went further down the path and realized it's not just about taking risks that involve like physical risks. Sometimes it's entrepreneurial risks or, you know, money risks or investments and things like that. So let's take this concept of risk and kind of blow it up and say, what type of risks? are we talking about? And how do we make sure that people who get that strong aversion to it when they hear it start to warm up with it? Like we think that we can live without risk, that if we just bury our head in the sand, that nothing is going to change and we can ignore, you know, the risk. But we are surrounded by hidden risks in our life. Like getting in a car and driving to work is a risk that we take every single day. We, you know, but more of us are afraid of getting eaten by a shark in the ocean than we are with driving a car. So trying to make sure that we're right-sizing risks and we're evaluating them in the right light because our minds have, again, this amazing ability to catastrophize the downside of some of our choices. So trying to get people to be more aware of what risk-taking actually is and that it doesn't have to be scary. As you were saying earlier, Denise, it's something small that we can start. It doesn't have to be epic. I... (laughs) Thank you. I was laughing. I had to mute myself because I was laughing. When you started talking about, you know, the things that we're afraid of, I instantly got this picture in my head of a toddler who has just come out of the bathtub running across the the living room completely naked with his hands over his eyes going, you can't see me naked because I can't (laughs) see you, so you can't see me. I think a lot of us do that way too many times. Exactly. I think so, too. And sometimes we just don't understand or aren't aware enough about how much risk we coexist with. So if we coexist with something, shouldn't we know a little bit about it? And how do we use the skill set to our advantage? So rather than being at the mercy of risk, that we can be more uncomfortable or be more comfortable in uncertainty or be more comfortable with our discomfort and using that as an opportunity to grow and not shrink from the experience. I love that. Listen, I sincerely appreciate your company today and the book and spending time with you has been a distinct pleasure. It's really fun talking with you. 
would you mind sharing your online presence and your preferred means of contact for people who wish to learn more about you? And you had mentioned um, something where they can go get the I can't remember what you said it was now. I should have written oh, it down. The Risk Manifesto. Yep, that yes. is all within the book. So if you want to stay engaged, you can go to my website. It's AngieWitkowski.com. So Angie, W-I-T-K-O-W-S-K-I.com. And you can find me with that name on all my social channels. And yeah, I look forward to staying engaged and answering any questions that your listeners have. Angie, thank you so much. And for the audience, as we come to the end of today's episode, I would like to request your valuable feedback. If you found our insights useful and enjoyed the show, we would really greatly appreciate it if you could leave us a review and a rating on iTunes. Your feedback helps us to grow and inspire more people on their success journeys. So be sure to hit that subscribe button, leave a review, and share your partner in Success Radio with your friends and colleagues. And be sure to go look for Angie and get that book. It's really, it's a terrific book. So thank you for tuning in and we look forward to catching you on the next one. Angie, again, thank you so much. Denise, it was a pleasure connecting with you. Thank you for the opportunity. Get your voice heard. If you would like to launch your own far-reaching podcast, contact Denise Griffiths at yourofficeontheweb.com and go to the podcast tab.